So I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I've learned a lot from my wife. And one of the main things I've learned that I was not uh, nearly alert enough about when we first met and got married was the power of a prophetic lifestyle. Okay, that's what I'm going to call it right now. And you, you would put worship in there and prayer in there on the positive side, but you would also put, my problem was I was too logical about the things of God. And, I, and, I, and if I didn't fully understand it logically, then I had still had some unbelief. I was having a hard time believing by faith, but I also underestimated the power of the gifts of the Spirit of God in my life. And part of it was my upbringing, part of it was the early church experiences that I had. But another part was that by being married to Tricia, I was married to somebody who has a very strong prophetic gift. And because two become one, I was learning from her by living together with her. And there's an impartation. And I hope she would say that she's, she has said it. Said it last, last week? No, Father's Day, yeah, uh, that that has happened. So that's what's supposed to happen in a marriage. It's, you know, we're supposed to see each other's strengths and validate those strengths and not object to everything that we find that's different, that you might call a weakness, and she might call an opportunity for me to grow. <laughs> and I just learned to major on the majors and not major on the minors. But I also really, I saw in operation what it was like to live in that place where you were hearing from God on a regular basis, where she was hearing from God more than I was on a regular basis. I knew the word really well. I've studied it well. But I wasn't able to apply it as quickly and as accurately, I didn't have the same discernment that she did. And, and I, it really provoked me to want to know more and to want to dig in. And then, as I've said, Chuck Pierce, same thing. When you go down to glory of Zion and you're in that atmosphere, there's an impartation that comes. So when I say power of a prophetic lifestyle, I'm not saying that that's more important or less important than other gifts. I just undervalued it because I didn't understand it. In the world I grew up in, MBA, finance, spreadsheets, you know, everything has a formula and there leads to a right answer. And meanwhile, God is saying, I need you to live a dynamic, improvisational lifestyle. I need to be able to talk to you in a way that is breaking out of the old mold. You can't keep staying in that old wineskin just because it's comfortable for you. You've got to learn to take risks. And, and, be, and that was to me. That was his word to me. You've got to be comfortable, what Dutch Sheets called it. He said, you've got to learn how to preach from the river. That's actually what a prophet told him. And he was like, preach from the river? Why are you talking in code? And same problem. He was just locked into his message, and he wasn't able to be flexible and fluid if the Lord gave him a word. He actually didn't trust the Lord in his own life enough to say, well, he wouldn't do that for me. Well, of course he'll do that for you. He wants that to be the case. So one of the Psalms that, that I've been studying is this one, Psalm 73. And it's a long one. I only gave you some verses in it. But here's the problem. You're going through life. And you cope through, through certain things well, but then there's other things that really get you hijacked. That's the best word I know. And other people don't get as hijacked about those things, but they get hijacked about something else. So there's probably an area in all of our lives that we don't handle things well, and we need God's help in all of it, but especially those where we tend to shut down. And that's the power of a prophetic lifestyle. It can help break you out of an old way of thinking, a conditioned way of thinking, that might be based on partial truth, but isn't based on the full knowledge of God, that full relationship. So what did he say in Psalm 73, verse 1? This is the Passion Translation. No one can deny it. We just sang it. God is really good to Israel and to all those with pure hearts. Amen? You're supposed to answer me if you agree. He's good. No one can deny it. God is really good to Israel and to all those with pure hearts. But here's what he says. But I nearly miss seeing it for myself. Ever been there? Yeah, because we get those blinders on and the bigger picture gets lost in the thing that we're focused on. Hmm, I nearly missed seeing it for myself. Here's my story, verse 2. I narrowly missed losing it all. Okay? So on Wall Street, we would say, I was right on the edge staring at the abyss. The whole thing was about to come down. He's saying, I narrowly missed that. I was stumbling. What was he stumbling over? What I saw with the wicked. I'm just going to put the wicked in quotes for a minute. Okay, we know what he means, what the psalmist is saying, not the not godly people. But I just want to back up for a minute and say, don't assume because somebody disagrees with you that they're wicked. <laughs> okay, they might just be confused. There might be things that, that are in their background that you don't fully know. 
I really don't want the, uh, the church to take on the attributes of the world. I want the church to take the attributes of Jesus on, right? And uh, he wasn't shaming people when the apostles wanted to bring fire down uh, on people that weren't hospitable. Jesus said, no, I didn't come to destroy life. I came that you might have life. Be careful that you don't abuse your power, right? So that's all I'm saying. I was stumbling over what I saw with the wicked. I'm going to just broaden it to say with my opponent, okay? They're nothing but bullies, threatening God's people. They're loudmouths with no fear of God, pretending to know it all, windbags full of hot air, impressing only themselves. Yet the people keep coming back to listen to more of their nonsense. <laughs> How many of you felt that way <laughs> about somebody? Yeah, okay. But that tends to minimize their value in our eyes instead of saying, yeah, but what does God see? Because if I have the truth, I should be able to speak to them and help them turn from the way they're thinking into another way of thinking. That's what Jesus did for us. He got us to repent and recognize that there was, there was something wrong because it's so much easier to call out the problem than to give a solution. And if we're not even listening to each other, if all we can do is shout at each other, then it's just bound to keep spiraling downward. Okay, I'm not saying don't be firm. I'm just saying have an open lens to what the Lord will show you with that prophetic lifestyle of how you're going to want to how you going to approach people and speak with them. All right, and then he said this, and I'm sure in verse 13 many have have lived this life experience. He said, "Have I been foolish to play by the rules and keep my life pure?" Right? There's that man. If the if the wicked are prospering so much. Have I been wrong to do this, follow the Lord? And I'm sure everybody in the room here would say, absolutely, it's not wrong. You do what the Lord tells you to do because that's the right way to live because we're accountable to him, not accountable to the standard of this world that was derived by sin. No. And then he said this, another really powerful thing I want to try to help you understand for the moment that we're in right now. If I had given in to my pain, and spoken of what I was really feeling, it would have sounded like unfaithfulness to the next generation. All right? So look at the authority we have as leaders, as Christians, as ambassadors for the Lord. It doesn't say don't ever speak your pain. He's saying where I was, that dark place I was at, I, I just shouldn't have spoken from there because I didn't get realigned with God first. All right? I hope this is not too confusing the way I'm explaining it, but... That's what I used to do because I wouldn't get on my knees and pray first and say, Lord, I'm really confused. I need, to, I need to hear from you before I even talk about whatever it was that was bothering me, right? And that's another attribute that Trisha taught me. What did the Lord say? You know, how much time have you spent asking him about his opinion on this? And it was like, well, I don't want to bother him with that. This is not a big one. Yeah, bad mistake. Don't do it. Nothing's, he, he cares about it all, okay? Nothing's too small for him. Ask him for everything. Oh, this is 16, man. When I tried to understand it all, I just couldn't, other versions say. I, it was overwhelming. I was just overwhelmed by what I was feeling. It was all too puzzling and too much of a riddle to me. But 17 is really the key. It says, but then one day, say that with me, but then one day. But then one day, I was brought into the sanctuaries of God. And in the light of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. That's what happens with a prophetic lifestyle. That's what I learned to, to just really covet. That's what the Bible says. We're allowed to covet the gifts, right? One of the few things we're allowed to covet, maybe one of the only that I can remember in the Bible. Hmm. So when you're in a confused place and you don't know what to do, you go into the sanctuary of God. Now, that could be your closet, your prayer closet. Somebody was reminding me the other day in that movie, um, I'm sorry, it's Tony Evans' daughter, War Room. War Room. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, she did a great job, right? Remember when they were going to sell the house, a pastor was going to buy the house, and he said, I could tell somebody's been praying in here. And you know, that's that, that resonance that happens when we're in the presence of God. So here it is. I'm struggling with something emotionally, but when the confusion left was when I entered into the sanctuary. It doesn't mean a formal building. It means the presence of the Lord. If we're under his shadow, it should never be far away. He's a very present help right now. 
in the time of trouble that we're in. Like Chuck Pierce said in that word I read, there's shadows being cast, but I want you to be in my shadow. Look for my shadow, and as you illuminate yourself, you're going to change the position of where I can go because your light is going to change the direction of my movement. It's so powerful, but not without getting first into the sanctuary and spending time with him and hearing from him. And then you all know probably Isaiah 26.3, I heard it when Andre, Andre Crouch sang it in a song. I will keep, keep you in perfect peace when you keep your mind stayed on me. But I like the way the voice uh, brought it out. It said, you, Lord, will keep the peace, a perfect peace for all who trust in you, for those who dedicate their hearts and minds to you. Okay, so just something he showed me was, if you're not at peace, maybe, Peter, it's because you haven't fully dedicated your heart and your mind to me. You're drifting too far off into things you don't know enough about. <laughs> so trust in the eternal one forever, for he is like a great rock, strong, stable, trustworthy, and lasting.